Welcome to Portal Asset Management's monthly webinar. Portal seeks to bring you conversations with some of the leading digital asset creators, commentators, and regulators. It is a place to be inquisitive, questioning, and engaged. Portal's webinars are broadcast live and are then made available on all major podcast platforms. My name is Derek Graham, and I am the CEO of Portal Asset Management, and hosting the webinar is Mr. Mark Witten, CIO of Portal Asset Management. Please be aware that neither Portal, its guests, or listeners are providing financial advice. So, uh, so welcome along to our monthly Portal Asset Management webinar. Uh, this is part of Portal's ongoing commitment to share industry insights and educate on this rapidly growing and evolving space. Portal does these monthly webinars. It also does weekly podcasts known as Beyond Bitcoin, where we unpack different current topics, technologies, or adoption of blockchain in various countries over a 30 minute show with guest speakers. Um, monthly market commentary uh, is sent out along with our newsletter. Quarterly reports um, are sent out. And each year we do a deep dive uh, summary of the, uh, of the year that's been. Uh, for um, investors and followers. Uh, we also do quarterly face-to-face -face meetings with our portal direct investors. So we've worked out that in total, we do about 80 informational and educational pieces um, per annum. Um, and these can be found on our website, uh, portal.am, under the resources section. So you're always welcome to go there and, uh, and download and share any of that. Uh, a quick introduction to our funds. Uh, Portal Asset Management is the advisor to three institutional grade fund offerings um, across a diverse investment, um, offerings diverse investment across the crypto um, asset space at different levels of volatility. So the flagship fund is the Portal Digital Fund. It is a fund of institutional grade funds covering 11 funds and over 50 strategies from long positions to chosen investment theses. Um, and to market neutral and momentum funds. Uh, the goal is to provide investors with exposure to the market with reduced volatility of around 25%. The fund has outperformed the market over the past two years. Um, Radiance is a mid volatility fund with direct investments into crypto assets. We choose to do deep research into each one of these sectors of the space, and then we invest one to three uh, liquid offerings within each sector. In due course, we plan to invest up to 30% of the funds under management in early stage tokens as the market recovers. It's designed to outperform the market with a volatility of some 30 to 50%. And so finally, Horizon is a very simple fund that gives exposure to the top 25 tokens, less stable coins, reweighted monthly. So its volatility is around 70%, or it's really the volatility of the market itself. So let me introduce you to our CIO and the host of today's webcast, Mr. Mark Witten. Hello, Mark. Thanks, Derek. Thanks for the introduction. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited today to be talking to the principals of, of M31 Capital. Uh, joining us, we have Nathan Montone and the CEO and CIO and Michael Swenson, the CEO and Director of Risk Management. Um, I started following M31 just over a year and a half ago. Um, they officially launched in January 2020. Um, they're a global investment firm focused exclusively on crypto assets and blockchain technologies um, and have a couple of offices around the world. Their fund is primarily focused on decentralized finance and Web3 technologies. Um, and they actively participate in the underlying protocols to generate enhanced returns. I think what really attracted me um, to M31 Capital is the niche focus on Web3 and DeFi, uh, as well as the real, really deep rigor um, of the investment process, as well as the operational robustness. And then in line with that, um, if I just can introduce the, the principles who, who bring a depth of experience to the market, Nathan Monzone is basically one of the one of the co-founders and the CEO, and he was one of the earliest evangelists for this space. He's been involved in crypto and Bitcoin since around 2011. He's a venture capitalist and angel investor. He's a track record of successfully investing in quite a lot of groundbreaking technologies. He's invested in over 100 startups collectively worth you know billions today. He was an early backer of some of the most successful blockchain and crypto asset projects, including Helium, LifePeer, Filecoin, and Thorchain. 
He's a graduate of Columbia University, where he studied financial economics and, and English literature, interesting combination, as well as Harvard Business School. Um, Michael, his partner, is a co-founder and the chief operating officer, and he brings 20 years of experience in running best-in-class hedge fund operations and risk oversight programs. Michael previously served as the chief operating officer of Bridgewater Associates for over five years. He was responsible for the strategic management of a half a billion dollar budget, as well as the development of the firm's internal risk governance framework, which they have recently updated and sent through to me after the, the current ruminations we've experienced in the market. Prior to Bridgewater, Michael held senior level positions at Goldman Sachs and Alliance Bernstein and was appointed co-chair of SIFMA's Continuity and Risk Committee. So, you know, we, we're very privileged and grateful to you guys for joining us today. I think, you know, as a starting point, before we start talking about the, the market and so forth, I think it would be good just to get, you know, in, in addition to the biographies I've, I've kind of gone through, just a little bit of your background and what attracted you to this space. And, and as you put it before the call, in terms of falling down the rabbit hole, you know, what, what was the catalyst for you becoming involved with crypto, considering your backgrounds in, in, in other asset classes? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for uh, the introduction, and thanks for having us uh, uh, on the webinar here. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's honestly so long ago. It's uh it's difficult to remember. I, I remember first falling down the you know proverbial Bitcoin rabbit hole back in two thousand eleven, uh, towards the end of the year, and and I you know I'd heard about this Bitcoin project online, and I, I wanted to um, participate in it, but there, of course there were no exchanges at the time. There was no Coinbase mobile app or any way to get exposure to uh, to Bitcoin by buying it. The the only way to get Bitcoin was uh, uh, by earning it. You had to participate in the Bitcoin network, um, you know, by by adding value and, and time and energy, you know, uh, to the Bitcoin blockchain to, to mine, you know, newly issued BTC. Uh, and so that sort of sent me down, you know, the mining side of the uh, the Bitcoin industry, uh, which you know set the foundation for what would later become uh, M31's mining arm, uh, M31 mining, and, and and that sort of economic model of uh, you know proof of work or, or what's now being called uh, work to earn uh, is sort of making a comeback in the Web3 space and a lot of projects like Helium and, and Filecoin Alive here we can uh, we can dive into uh, later. Um, but so, you know, I started on the Bitcoin side of things. Then, of course, when Ethereum launched, um, I just got incredibly excited about uh, programmable blockchains and uh, the smart contract applications that uh, that were being, you know, tinkered with and experimented with uh, on top of Bitcoin, uh, on top of Ethereum, rather. Um, and so I, I started participating in, in the, ETH, the ETH ecosystem more, uh, investing and advising, you know, a lot of projects that later be, went on to become, you know, some of the largest in the space. Um, and so that, that this is a lot of the work I was doing prior to officially launching uh, M31 with, with Mike. Um, but the sort of founding ethos of, of M31, as you heard from our, our very different backgrounds, um, we, want, we set out to build, you know, an institutional grade investment platform uh, dedicated to crypto assets, you know, taking a crypto native investment approach. Um, you know, so on Mike's side, he brings, you know, several decades of, uh, experience managing risk and operations, uh, you know, previously, you know, when I met him, he was chief operating officer at Bridgewater and, uh, prior to that Goldman Sachs, as you mentioned everything. And on my side, you know, about a decade of investment uh, experience specifically in the crypto, uh, asset class. And so we wanted to bring that together to sort of launch, uh, something that didn't exist in the space and, um, uh, which is, you know, an operationally best in class managed fund, institutional grade, SEC compliant and everything uh, without sacrificing sort of the, the interesting uh, nuances of crypto native investing. So that was sort of the background of, of M31. And maybe I'll let Mike jump in with a, a bit on his background to flesh that out. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark uh, and Derek, thanks again for inviting us to the webinar and great to, to speak with everyone on the call today. You know, I think you guys, you know, covered my background pretty well, you know, just a couple of points I'll drive home and then Mark, I'll circle back to your question on, you know, how I kind of entered into the crypto space, but, you know, my, largely my career has been focused on exactly, you know, what Nathan kind of just laid out there, which was, you know, building and running best in class hedge fund operations um, and, and pairing that together with, you know, implementing the right, uh, right shape and size risk and security oversight programs that go hand in glove with the, uh, the operational you know, rigor and discipline that you, that you need so badly in this space. And so that's largely been what my career has been focused on. That's largely my responsibility and remit is, you know, both building and running those best in class operational risk uh, policies, practices, and procedures, you know, making sure that M31 can continue to grow and scale, 
at speed, but doing so with the security first mindset um, and then ensuring that we have the right infrastructure and global partners to support us. It's not just Nathan, myself and the global team with the dots that are behind Nathan's head there on the screen. You know, it's all the, it's all the, the strategic partners that make this go to ensure that we have the right infrastructure that we can expand and, and get access to whatever uh, assets or tokens that we're looking to invest in within our mandate. And so it's, it, it really is, um, this unique relationship between, between me and Nathan coming from polar opposites that I think makes us so successful. Um, we challenge each other all the time. We have different perspectives and different different viewpoints, but I think that's that's part of the beauty and secret sauce here at M31 Capital. And, you know, looking forward to kind of diving a little deeper into our strategy and, and, and going from there. Thanks, that's awesome. Well, I think I think if, if, if you have two partners that agree on everything, you probably don't need one, right? Yeah, exactly. That, that goes double in the investment. Iron tends to sharpen iron. Um, I think, you know, let, let's just start with the macro and, and kind of you know, assess where we are in the world today, um, because the macro has been driving a lot of what we've seen in the underlying micro in, in, in some of the markets. Um, you know, we, we discussed this briefly on our, on our calls in the past, but we are seeing a lack of very clear leadership globally. Um, some very poor decisions around energy, um, increasing geopolitical risks. Um, you know, we, we, we've sort of moved into a world, it seems, where in some instances, data is not being um, taken as seriously as, as opinion, which is, has always been concerning because you tend to make the wrong choices when you focus on emotion rather than objectivity and, and data analysis. I mean, it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, the, the CPI numbers came out not, not too much worse of, than expected, but the Fed is maintaining a very hawkish view yet markets are reacting in the opposite way to what you would expect. It's not risk off, it seems to be the party's back on and the punch bowl is going to be refilled. So, you know, let's just get your views on the, on the macro and how it's unfortunately filtered through into the crypto space, although the underlying DeFi protocols are showing much better growth potential than, than, than you know, some of the traditionally listed equities and definitely fixed income and real estate. So I'll kind of start there and then we'll, we'll move on to some of the underlying um, details in, in the micro and then we'll talk about operations and risk management as well. Uh, yeah, perfect. I can break it out into sort of two, two ways of thinking about it, even though right now, like you said, macro is sort of driving everything. So it's, it's all really just macro related. Talking about macro kind of sets the directional stage for, um, for the market going forward. But it, it's really better to look at what's happening in the macro space and then separate that out from what's happening in the crypto world. So what we're seeing on chain and what we're seeing in the fundamentals driving uh, some of these things uh, in the Web3 and the DeFi space. But, um, you know, for starters, we're not, we're not a macro fund. So take, you know, all of our macro views with, uh, you know, a bucket of salt. Um, I think uh, one, one thing that you said that, you know, kind of perfectly summed it up is related to the lack of um, credibility in, the, uh, in our institutional class or, you know, our political leaders and increasingly, you know, at the Fed, they, they, they've lost a lot of their credibility, you know, fighting the recession, then fighting the, the you know, inflation, um, like, they're, like they're currently doing. I think a lot of people just watch them, you know, uh, create massive inflation, trying to fight uh, a COVID recession, and then now flip 180 degrees, run to the other side of the ship. And now they're trying to, trying to manufacture a recession to fight the inflation that they created. So uh, a lot of people are looking at that and, and kind of uh, with confusion and saying, you know, well, what was that about? Uh, and, and does it make sense, you know, kind of bigger picture to um, put all our eggs in kind of this discretionary monetary policy driven by human emotion? Um, or, you know, maybe take a closer look at something like a Bitcoin standard, which is a programmatic monetary policy. So I, I think there's a kind of, that's a longer term, uh, longer term, you know, kind of a generational play, but it, it's definitely something that's factoring in now the, the lack of credibility from, uh, uh, from the Fed. Um, you know, and then, you know, we've got shorter term outlook on kind of the macro front, I think, you know, the economic data in the US is likely to start coming in significantly weaker than expected in the Fed's been kind of, you know, standing on this, uh, uh, this talking point of, you know, we're going to be data driven, and uh, uh, the US economy is strong enough to withstand further rate hikes. And uh, as the as the data comes in, you know, not in support of that, it's gonna be very difficult for them to continue hiking rates into, you know, clearly a recession. Um, so that's sort of the, the you know, the, the what they're caught between. Um, all of that is kind of on the macro side. So separate and unrelated or separate and separate from the um, what we're seeing in the crypto world. And this has been kind of, you know, very strange for me because as someone who's been investing in the space since, 
you know, since 10 years. Um, every cycle prior to this, what we've seen is, you know, the opposite. We've seen prices go parabolic. We've seen these exponential advances in, you know, blow off tops unsupported by fundamentals. And then you get, you know, a 90% drawdown in, in price. This time we got exactly the opposite. So we never got the blow off top uh, in the first place. Uh, prices still drew down for macro reasons and fundamentals are in support of it. So fundamentals are in support of further growth of, of these uh, of asset prices. So what we're seeing on chain is, you know, monthly active users, daily active users are in a lot of cases hitting all time highs. We're seeing revenue generated by DeFi protocols um, and Web3 protocols hitting all time highs, you know, for consecutive quarters in a row, you know, things like uh, Live Peer have shown six consecutive quarters of all time high network activity, right? And, and prices have just come down and down and down. So this is kind of the first cycle we've seen in crypto where the fundamentals are improving and, uh, and prices have come down a lot, uh, despite the fact we never got this, that kind of blow off top that's that characterized, you know, every peak prior. Um, so just, you know, a couple interesting points on that front. Do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, no, I think Nathan covered it well. The, the only thing I'd add, um, just kind of clicking in a little bit what Nathan says is, you know, again, our, our global team that's kind of geographically dispersed around the world, you know, we kind of implement a follow the sun model. And it's, it's kind of, it, it's it's really important and relevant in the sense that, you know, this divergence that Nathan's describing between prices and fundamentals, this is what our team does 24-7, 365 days a year. They're constantly looking at what what we're seeing on chain, what 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 is, what is, what is the data telling us? What does it potentially mean in terms of our strategy and our go forward, you know, positioning? And so it's just just wanted to kind of connect that back into something very tangible that, you know, when we think about the macro views and we look more holistically across the space, what are we doing day to day to kind of keep a, a pause on that? So I think, you know, I think the the price tends to be um, the perception. You know, if I can just relate it to, let's say, um, one of the first companies that I looked at was a was was it was, it, was, it was an alcohol company. Um, and, you know, we'd look at the price and the price over a one year period would be, you know, 200 and then it would drop to 100 and sometimes in a correction even lower. And it, so the perception was often based on changing market expectations. But the underlying reality was at that point in time, SAB Miller was continuing to grow, you know, their distribution, grow beer revenue, grow beer sales, you know, compress margins. You, know, you never saw price wars in the beer market, right? The price of beer never comes down. So the underlying business was very healthy and generating lots of cash, but the perception kept changing based on risk on risk off. And I think that's where the opportunity comes. If you're an astute fund manager who's actually done the deep dive research and done the work is you can identify, you know, you can separate the wheat from the chaff and say, well, this is a bit of a pie in the sky model and you need this sort of market for this to work. Whereas, you know, what you spoke about earlier, Live Peer, for example, you know, it's continuing to grow, continuing to build out its, its, its base and so on. And generate cash so you know that's where i think the opportunities will come in because the, the the real returns i believe in fund management are made when you're purchasing very much distressed assets not not when you're trying to catch the wave when you're sort of halfway up um, and in line with that i mean you guys run quite a concentrated fund you run sort of roughly 10 to 20 positions liquid enough to exit but you have a vc like structure you know just as a caveat We've we we've backed M31 and, and we have a position in them. Um, and we really back both the team as well as the 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 niche, the macro that they're focusing on or the sector they're focusing on. And most importantly, we'd look at the the underlying investment process and the operational robustness of the business. And all those things come together um, in terms of bringing what we believe is a much better pedigree of, of fund manager into the space over the past few years. But your investment thesis is also predicated on the fact that being a concentrated fund. You can't afford to to make you know you can't afford to back lots of duds. You have to kind of get it right more often than not. Not just timing the market, which is you know that's a bit of a coin flipping game, but actually finding real assets that are going to you know deliver the next whatever the whatever the number is in terms of return, but become the next unicorns. Do you think that's kind of the the correct way of looking at it at the moment? That the perception is a little bit I wouldn't say wrong, but the perception is is extremely bearish. But the underlying reality is actually very bullish. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, of course, not for every asset. I mean, it, it still is the case. You know, there's over a hundred thousand assets in the crypto space. You know, the vast majority of them are utter garbage. You know, to, to be quite frank. Um, but to throw the baby out with the bathwater would be a massive mistake. This, this, the DeFi sector, the Web three sector. I mean, the way we conceptualize DeFi is 
you know, it, it's the decentralized, it literally is a decentralized finance. So it's the decentralized Wall Street, right? And Web3, we think of as decentralized Silicon Valley. And both are displaying, you know, leapfrog innovations over the uh, incumbent technology. So in, in DeFi, we're talking about re-architecting, re you know, fi traditional financial products and services on chain. So borrowing and lending and spot trading and derivatives trading and insurance and fixed income, uh, but building those products on chain. So they become immediately orders of magnitude faster and cheaper and more secure with a better user interface. It immediately blows open access to you know, anyone, anywhere in, the, anywhere in the world with an internet connection um, and creates a financial system that's, you know, fundamentally more transparent, um, you know, with less counterparty risk, uh, verifiable solvency, uh, all of these things. Uh, and, and this is, you know, more important now than ever looking at kind of what happened in the centralized finance space last month with kind of the implosion of a lot of the, uh, um, the trad fire traditional finance lenders. Um, it just underscores, you know, every day more and more the, uh, the need for an open, financial system, a, a transparent, you know, on-chain metrics that people can track in real time instead of on a quarterly basis and, and all of that. So there, there is fundamental value here. Um, you have to know, like you said, you have to, you have to know how to separate the wheat from the chaff. And a lot of that comes with time investing in the space. So being able to parse through the token economics uh, to see where value is accruing to, for these projects. Uh, you have to be able to see some, some things are you know, easily visible on chain. You can see, for example, how much people are paying to use these protocols. And, and that's sort of a, you know, a quick heuristic for um, value that they're deriving from these protocols. If someone, if, you know, a protocol that's solving, you know, a, a real problem for someone, so they're willing to pay real dollars uh, to solve this real problem. Um, that's, that's, you know, interesting. It's not the only thing, but that's, you know, a first kind of primary signal that there's something to dig into. And then you take that, you know, through our traditional diligence process onto our crypto native diligence process where we evaluate, you know, from a token economic design perspective, we look at open source risk, you know, we, we run audits of the code, for example, um, and all these sort of things to, to get comfort uh, before allocating. But there's there's huge value in this space. And for the right assets, you're hundred percent correct that we're seeing, you know, revenue generated at, at you know, all time high growth rates. We're seeing usage and adoption metrics pick up in general, developers are pouring into the space. We've never seen a downtick in the number of developers coming into the space or active addresses. Um, and money keeps pouring into the space as well. Just in the last quarter, we saw, you know, uh, over $15 billion pour into uh, this space. And, you know, kind of, it, it's a big number, but e even bigger when you consider that the entire market cap of the, of the DeFi space is only 20 billion. You know, the entire market cap of the Web3 space you know, infrastructure and application layer combined is about 30 billion. Um, and we just saw 16 or so billion pour into this space just in the last quarter. So the funding has not dried up. The developers have not, ha are continuing to pour in in mass from the web two sector and fundamentals for the right assets uh, continue to tick up and to the right. Um, so when prices are down, <laughs> fundamentals are up, valuations are looking a lot healthier. Um, because of that, you know, it's, it's, just, it's a very attractive time to get in, uh, again, for the right assets, not just broadly spray and pray across the entire um, sector. Two things I'll just quickly add to that if I can, Mark. You know, one, is, you know, when, when I first, when we first launched the fund back in January, 2020, I remember us having a slide in the deck where, you know, the, the crypt, crypto ecosystem had 10,000 assets, you know, tokens. Uh, today, it's well over 100,000. Right, and so it gives you a, an idea of the scale of innovation, how rapidly fast the space is evolving. M31 Capital being you know, sector focused on DeFi and Web3 allows us to kind of narrow down our focus to those specific sectors where we have expertise. And then that process, Nathan just kind of laid out, you know, that ongoing investment committee due diligence process, again, running 52 weeks a year, every single week we're looking at new opportunities, both inbound and outbound running them through that due diligence process. And we'll look at hundreds and hundreds of projects a year, but only a very small portion will make it through that funnel. Um, again, because we're only looking for the winners. We're only looking for the uh, investment opportunities that we have the highest conviction in, the ones that are solving real world problems that are gonna be around for the long term. Um, and again, not to say you get them all right, but that's, that's the ideal behind that investment committee process. And that's foundational to that repeatability and success that we've you know, kind of built since day one. You must think for a moment um, that DeFi is showing showing its, itself to be an exceptional sector. 
Um, what is perceived by many people, however, is that huge losses have occurred through um, investment in this sector and therefore DeFi must be involved. Um, so we've often talked about the 16 um, different investment um, funds that have invested in this section. We sort of uh, unfortunately nicknamed them the contagion of the incompetent. Um, and and they're the they're the, the three arrows and and um, the voyages and Celsius etc. People have to realise these are centralised traditional investment structures that have failed because they've over leveraged and rehypothecated their loans etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Meanwhile, DeFi is performing exceptionally well. There's been no defaults. Of course, there's no defaults because it's an algorithm driven system. There's no negotiating. You're not allowed to rehypothecate. Um, you are performing as you're meant to perform. How do you think we can get the message out there that DeFi is not CeFi and that investment in, in DeFi has performed exceptionally well and, and transactions in DeFi have, have stayed strong? Yeah, you're, you're exact. I mean, one thing is uh, we, we literally just wrote a newsletter about this uh, last month. We, we put a monthly newsletter out and, and the last one was about how, uh, how flawlessly DeFi performed in the face of all this CeFi contagion. You're right, it was the, it was the you know, strangest thing, maybe going back to Mark's point about how people are not paying enough attention to the, to the data. They just, they just hit the clickbait headline. But what we saw was, you know, after, um, you know, 3AC fell and that meant everyone, all the creditors to, to 3AC fell. So we saw BlockFi go down and Voyager and Celsius and, you know, anyone who had loaned money to, to 3AC fell. Uh, and somehow that put a black mark on the DeFi sector. And, and we said, you know, not a single one of those protocols, not, not a single one of those companies I just mentioned were DeFi protocols, right? They were all just very traditionally structured. You know, they raised equity. They were trad five firms um, doing what, what, you know, doing nothing different, right? They're leveraging sort of trad by opacity to take excessive risk uh, under the hood and, and operating off chain meant that they could take risks that, that no one is seeing. So uh, all of that sort of for us, again, highlighted the need for an open and a transparent financial system because it wouldn't be possible for these, um, for these a lot of these funds and firms and lending companies to get as big as they did um, with the transparency that blockchain technology offers because all of their books, all of their loan books would be perfectly, um, perfectly open source, you know, transparent, visible to everyone. We could follow the fund flows on chains. So we'd be able to see the, you know, sort of the wallet to wallet counterparty risk, if you will, that they're, that they're taking. We could monitor the health of their loan books in real time in a way that's just not possible with, um, you know, off chain or, or C5 protocols. Um, so kind of, you know, it's not a, it's not a you know, perfect answer to your question, but uh, I think it takes time. Unfortunately, I think you know, people have to see, you know, learn this lesson several times before you know, they, they get to the uh, realization that sort of a transparent you know, on-chain financial system is, is better than an opaque, you know, off-chain centralized one. And, and on this topic of perception, because it is a perception, you know, so these major central organized um, investment funds that have probably operated outside their mandate, have collapsed. Um, so therefore, the cryptocurrency algorithm driven sector must be broken. Well, that makes no sense at all, because they're two different things, of course. Um, and the other thing is that the issue around price and value. So you know, the sectors dropped nearly 70% in value. I haven't looked at the, the CCI 30 today, but uh, maybe a little lower than that, because it's had quite a good recovery month this month. Um, and so we've seen that tremendous drop in price. But we have looked at the fact that over the last 18 months, we estimate there's about $100 billion of venture capital money that has gone into the space. So it's well moneyed, it's well funded. And, and we've also seen that in the last 18 months that the market sector has nearly, or the user base has nearly tripled in size and continues to grow rapidly, much of it in developing countries um, along the way. So that kind of doesn't make sense. That doesn't reflect price. Um, how, how do you think, um, there's going to be maybe even a decoupling with these traditional TradFi markets such as, um, uh, you know, such as NASDAQ um, and a reflection of the real value that is, is getting into, you know, that this market is consistently building. Yeah, I, I mean, the market can stay, you know, irrational for, for quite some time, but it can't stay irrational, you know, forever. When, when you have, 
you know, an industry or an asset class or a set of protocols, you know, can even just be a, a handful that are providing real world value to real people. You know, they're, they're generating real revenue and that's coming in and it's, um, you know, uh, increasing their valuations when you see, you know, prices coming down and, and revenue generation ticking up. I mean, uh, the market doesn't stay completely irrational forever. And, and maybe kind of one good example, you know, there, there are protocols in the space. There's, there's one I'm thinking of in particular that has a, a $33 million uh, treasury uh, and it's held entirely in stable coins. And the market cap of the token is $19 million, right? How, so there, it just shows you how irrational a lot of these things have gotten. And, and the market can stay irrational. Of course, it can go, it can go lower, uh, et cetera. But one way or another, that gets resolved because either smart money with liquidity comes into the space, they recognize this divergence between price and fundamentals, and they close the gap. Or that those token holders for that project will um, vote on an improvement proposal to distribute the um, treasury assets to the token holders, you know, and they'll get immediately, you know, a 50% uh, increase in, in value. So one way or another, that gap gets closed. It's, you know, it's a question of um, how many people are paying attention to the fundamentals versus how many people are just looking at, you know, price alone as, as their determining factor. But, you know, for, for, for smart investors who understand how to dig through the, uh, the on-chain um, metrics and the analytics and, and find gems like this, um, you know, investing now is, is a no-brainer. One thing I there I would just add, to, you know, kind of what Nathan and, and you got and you were talking about here is, you know, really, you know, fighting that that huge misconception, you know, C5 versus DeFi and, and the failures that we've seen over the past couple months here. You know, a large part of our responsibility at M31 Capital is not just, you know, running the fund and, and meeting with our investors, but it's also educating our community. Right. And, and education in the space is so important and we're still so early days on you know crypto DeFi, web3 and you know i think the first year nathan and i launched we spent 90 percent of our time just you know educating people on what the space was all about and um it, it's so important and that's why we push out you know our data-driven weekly research we share our insights with our community and our investors uh, we try to be uh, overly transparent and communicative because the space really needs it right and, and again it, it seems like a the purest way to kind of change that perception. But again, to Nathan's point, it takes time, right? Because people just read flashy headlines and that's what they click on. And But I think ourselves and, and you and Mark, you guys are doing a portal. That's the way we organically kind of change mm. that narrative. Mm. Tell me just, you know, you guys as part of both your risk management and I assume your investment process, you weren't involved um, with, with the Terra Luna, Celsius, Three Arrows Capital. You never had any exposure to that. Was that a function of just you, you know the risk management side or or the investment hypothesis as well or the investment analysis side? You, because there's a question that's come in um, from one of the one of the audience members asking, you know, the view is that DeFi has a, a higher yield and return than traditional finance. Um, so what is the reason for this, given the more advanced risk management that DeFi carries? So I just thought maybe as as, as a lead up to that question. Perhaps give us the, the reasoning or the thinking behind the fact, because we did have, unfortunately, funds that were exposed to that and, and did pay the price. How, how did you avoid that, that pitfall? Yeah, so I mean, I'll start and, and Nathan, you could jump in, but just to, just to be, you know, first and foremost, totally clear, M31 Capital had zero exposure to, you know, Terra, UST, Three Arrows, Celsius, BlockFi, Voyager, or any of the related company, centralized companies and entities. Um, and largely that's, due to our, I, I, I say our institutional grade risk management policies and strict adherence to our, our controls that we have set up since day one. Um, I, I don't think uh, you can, most crypto funds in this space will have the same discipline and rigor that, that we set up and largely it's probably a carry through on the experience I brought over from my, my, my two decades plus in traditional finance and understanding how important it is, um, especially in a space like crypto to have, um, um, controls in place with the proper oversight in place and and um, the past two months being able to really validate that the controls we put in place uh, were effective right in the sense that you know we're still here we're still invested in the same tokens that we were invested in at the beginning of the year uh, and if anything we have more tokens than we had to start the year because of our strategy that we deploy underneath the fund and so um, it goes from everything, you know, just to kind of give the high level, you know, the way we think about um, our risk policy, policies, it's essentially, you know, nine key dimensions. You know, it starts with, you know, clear sector mandates and restrictions, 
you know, all about our institutional grade custodians that we've kind of partnered with internally, how we think about counterparty risk. We talked a lot about due diligence in the earlier part of the car call, asset exposure limits, you know, as well as blockchain or chain exposure limits, something I think a lot of funds do not think about. Um, contingency planning, key person, system risk, audited financials, regulatory oversight, all these things together. It's what I spend my day on looking at, you know, 24-7, 365 days a year, looking at to understand how are we positioned today, what are the things that we need to potentially focus on, and how do we want to be positioned tomorrow? Um, Nathan, you want to add anything to that? Uh, I think that's great. I think the second part of that question about uh, the risks inherent to uh, uh, interacting with DeFi protocols is, you know, kind of speaks to exactly what we saw, you know, the difference between DeFi and CeFi. Um, uh, last month in particular. And uh, what's kind of interesting is there, there's a, you know, the way we look at DeFi is, is de-risked versus CeFi because you, you're reducing that counterparty risk. You're reducing, you know, that um, the opaqueness, the opacity of, uh, of, of TradFi and everything. So, you know, interestingly, when Celsius, you know, a, a centralized uh, finance lender was, um, was winding down, the first creditors that they repaid were DeFi protocols. So the first, the first, you know, creditors to get repaid were Aave and uh, and, and Maker and Compound. Uh, they knew that they, they were the senior creditors, you know, at the high end of that stack uh, above everyone else. That was six hundred fifty million dollars repaid to DeFi protocols first and foremost, without, uh, you know, before um, repaying any of their other creditors um, uh, on their books. And that speaks to kind of the seniority of of DeFi, you know, the kind of it's less risky if you're you know, at the top of that creditor stack and everything. Um, and that was all, it was all code based, right? There were no lawsuits needed to, uh, you know, to force CFI to hand over assets to DeFi protocols. It was just, you know, they, they, they understood the code and they knew that, you know, they were going to get additional assets liquidated if, uh, if they didn't repay those loans to the DeFi protocols. Um, so we're, I think this is part of as well, what, what kind of changes people's mind about DeFi being, you know, high risk uh, versus CFI. Uh, when you see examples like that, or, you know, kind of at around the same time too, Uniswap overtook uh, Coinbase in daily trade volume. This, this happened last month. It's been happening uh, since. You've got a, a completely decentralized exchange with no employees, a purely code-based exchange is now overtaken, you know, the premier um, centralized exchange uh, in the crypto space uh, on a daily trade volume count. So you've got, you know, again, just a system that's more transparent, you know, it, it, it's easier to audit in real time. Um, by anyone anywhere in the world, um, and now it's it's proving that it's it's able to do what TradFi does, but better and you know mm -hmm. faster and cheaper. And we'll post the same numbers and the same metrics and uh, provide you know greater value at with less risk. Brilliant. So all of this is helping change kind of the narrative I think around uh, the DeFi CFI relationship. Yeah. I think I think from our experience, you know, over the past few years dealing with um, we've tried to position ourselves as an institutional grade fund. Um, with the same sort of rigor, and, and we've dealt with family offices, and you know, recently we were on a roadshow in in the UK and Switzerland, and we dealt with some of the bigger wealth managers and some of the biggest Swiss private banks. And a, a lot of the concern is obviously around regulation and a perceived lack of risk management in the space. And part of what we were explaining and going through is is the sort of pedigree of fund manager we've seen into the space over the past few years is quite a bit different than what we saw before that, um, where it seemed to be more focused on trend and technical analysis and that sort of thing. But DeFi didn't really exist as an asset class three years ago. Neither did, you know, Metaverse and, and Web3 and so on. So I think let's let's kind of, we, we, we've spoken about the uh, the risks, we've spoken about the, uh, the 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 issues in the space. I think let's, let's talk about what's really exciting, which is, you know, the, the coming growth in the space. Um, we, you know, I have three, you know, young kids under the age of 10 and already all three of them have Roblox accounts and are transacting in digital currencies, whether they know it or not Robux. And, you know, I, I see how much time they spend on the phone and, and, and iPad versus myself who that didn't exist when I was growing up. So what are you guys excited about? I'd love to hear some, some really good ideas that we could potentially pass off as our own. <laughs> yeah, I mean, high level, high level Web three. We're always happy to share alpha with you guys. Um, for us, the big focus is is really the Web three uh, side of things. It's kind of hit this this pivotal turning point where you know prior to this, like you said, Web three, the sector didn't really didn't really exist until you know quite recently. What that means basically is is the assets that com comprise the Web three space were all you know very boring, unsexy infrastructure plays. You know, like Filecoin and Livepeer and Helium. 
Uh, but they were really setting the foundation you know, for a decentralized backend internet infrastructure. Um, so now, now that a lot of that's been built, a lot of that was built you know, years ago. Some of, the, some of those protocols I just mentioned, Filecoin, et cetera, have been around since you know, the 2014 cycle. Um, so they've, they've, they've been battle tested through different markets and everything. And a lot of them are coming out the other side as, you know, with a recognition that they are genuine tech, you know, solving real problems. They actually work through different market cycles, um, et cetera, to the point where for the first time now, what we're seeing that's getting us very excited is decentralized application layer assets starting to get built on top of some of that decentralized backend infrastructure, right? So you, you know, for, as an example, like live peer, which, you know, I think I mentioned earlier, um, you know, a decentralized video transcoding protocol, like pretty boring stuff, you know, it's, it's reformatting file size, you know, uh, video um, file sizes to match, you know, your iPhone screen or a, a, a TV screen or an iMac or whatever. Um, but downstream of that is every single video application online. So you can't have, you know, Netflix or TikTok or YouTube, you know, without a video transcoding protocol you know, processing it and reformatting it behind the scenes. So now that Filecoin is built out and it works, it's battle tested, it's been through multiple market cycles, things like Huddle are starting to get built on, on top of it. And Huddle is a decentralized Zoom, you know, that was built on top of uh, LivePeer completely permissionlessly. It's not the same team or anything. It's a completely different team out of India that, that decided they, they wanted to build a decentralized Zoom on top of uh, LivePeer. And, uh, and we use it internally. We, we switched over from Zoom within the fund and now we, uh, run meetings on uh, on Huddle, um, which is built on top of Live Peer. So it just really interesting examples like that are starting to get built. And once you know, this is all a permissionless open source space. So once you've got that bedrock set, you know, it catalyzes this exponential growth at the application layer on top. So we're, we're going to start seeing a lot more of these sort of, you know, decentralized YouTube, a decentralized Twitter, decentralized you know, um, TikTok, all of these things. Now that we have kind of the base infrastructure already built out and uh, in a robust, resilient, decentralized way. So that, that's what we're focused on. Now. You think you'll face the same challenges of potential um, things like censorship, things like, um, you know, algos that up or downgrade, you know, things like misinformation, et cetera. Do you think the, they're going to face the same challenges or do you think being decentralized, they'll have a, a more, should we say, democratic way of dealing with it? Yeah, maybe maybe you're leading the witness a bit there, but uh, of course you've got greater you've greater privacy guarantees, you know, greater resiliency. These are decentralized protocols. So Zoom, you know, has had enormous issues with privacy invasions and uh, you know the lack of uh, you know data sovereignty, uh, you know, data gathering and, and data mining and uh, privacy concerns and, and all of this stuff and Zoom bombing and you know using Zoom in China is a very different thing than using Zoom in the United States. So. Um, by building these things, by re-architecting kind of the, the technology stack on uh, decentralized infrastructure backends, uh, you're building a more resilient, robust system, one that's less prone to censorship or deplatformings or shadow bannings or, you know, privacy invasions and, and all of this sort of thing. And, and the beauty of it is that no one really cares about privacy. If you poll people, no one, no one puts privacy up there, like very few people, right? And, and if you look at their actions, no one's optimizing for you know, privacy. So the beauty of a lot of the, the web free um, application layer assets is that privacy is sort of an add on benefit. You know, people are coming to web free assets because they're orders of magnitude cheaper than uh, the web two incumbents. And then accidentally as an added benefit, they're getting enhanced privacy and security guarantees um, and data sovereignty and, and all of these uh, uh, additional benefits that sort of return us back to the, the principles of uh, the, the vision of web one with decentralization and privacy and open source software and, and all of that. Um, so I think that's a, quite a clever, you know, benefit or, or whatever for the um, usage of web three tech. And there, there, there's more examples of this we could, we could list, but. Yeah, I think Nathan, it was just the other day we were talking about how interesting it is in the web three space, how we're actually going back to the, like you said, the ethos of web 1.0, right? focusing on open protocols, decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, privacy, you know, all, all that. But with the added benefit of bringing in the UX from Web 2.0 and the convenience factor of Web 2, right? Yeah. And then, again, without losing the, again, that core ethos that we both really support, and I, I know Mark and, and, and Derek, you guys support in the space, it's, uh, it's fascinating. And I know at the beginning of the call, we said, you know, we were a DeFi and Web, Web 3 fund since day one. 
just to put that into context, I think for the first 18 months of our existence, there was only a handful of high quality Web3 protocols that you could really invest in. And now, you know, in the last six, eight, 10 months, this is where, like Nathan was describing, we're starting to see that consumer app face and layer starting to be built out. And it's super exciting for us. And um, it's amazing. Like you said, Mark, I, I think of the same thing. What, what are my kids going to be using versus what, what I've been using, what I've grown up with? It's going to be quite a different space and exciting yeah. days. Ahead. It's, it's a little bit too, it provides, you know, somewhat of a hedge in the sense that, you know, the two big risks right now are inflation versus recession, but, you know, not, not to sound like a permable here, but both of those, you know, end scenarios catalyze adoption of Web3 tech. And, and what I mean is, you know, if you go back to kind of the COVID, the COVID crash, mass layoffs, um, everyone came online and, uh, it, you know, adoption of, uh, of Web3 technologies uh, exploded. So we saw, you know, the number of hotspots distributed around the world went parabolic. We saw, you know, Bitcoin's hash rate hit all time highs because people were looking for, you know, alternative income sources and everything. So our kind of, you know, framework for this is basically in a recession, what, what we've seen time and time again, you know, every, every sort of drawdown um, in the real world drives individuals to crypto for income. And I think what we'll see, you know, my, my expectation here, and we're seeing more and more evidence of this in the inflationary scenario is that what you'll see is companies coming to crypto for cost cuts because these, this technology, you know, Filecoin is, you know, a 15 X cost reduction versus Amazon web services. And, uh, you know, a lot of these things like live peer is, is, uh, on the order of a 10 X cost reduction versus, uh, you know, Google cloud or Microsoft Azure. So I think just for that reason, every company in the world right now is going line item by line item on their expense. She's trying to figure out where to cut costs. And I think what's, what's going to start happening increasingly is that they'll, they'll become more open-minded to the web three. Um, infrastructure stack because it provides this uh, this enormous cost benefit uh, through decentralization. It's, it's magnitude four or cheaper. Um, so you'll see companies start onboarding into the Web three space in mass because of the cost cutting reason. And then what I mentioned earlier is that the accidental added benefit of that is you know stronger technology, you know more resiliency, greater data privacy, and uh, uh, you know privacy guarantees in general. So yeah, that, that we're seeing a lot of that now. It's very very cool. That's that's really interesting. Um, sorry, just to 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 the to everyone in the audience, feel free to either you know unmute and ask a question, or to type a question and just send it out in the chat, and I'll I'll relay it through. Um, I think just in the you know we we we've got a little bit of time left. Um, in, in the kind of closing from my side, I think part of the challenge is that you're fighting in some ways incumbents that have got massive balance sheets, the likes of Amazon Web Services, Google, Facebook, etc that that control a massive amount of advertising and almost you know th they control the group think and you know not many people understand that there's a substitute not many people understand that huddle is a substitute for that the news just isn't out there and i think it will get out there as the sort of you know the invisible hand as they call it starts you know moving through and there's that tipping point that's reached when enough people have adopted the technology which i believe number one there's the pull factor of the the costs and the the better use or the better design of the technology. But there's also this push factor we've seen with the likes of, you know, as I spoke about, you know, censorship and so on, but also government overreach, people being concerned. I mean, in, in, in particularly in places like China right now, there's runs on the banks. We're going to start seeing that ripple through. People are going to be unable to, to access their funding. And that makes people start thinking, well, where else can I move capital to where it's safe um, and potentially where you control it? So I do think that there's push and pull factors that bode very well. I'm in the same camp as you. I don't see a very good outcome when you print this much money and then you you allow energy to run this hard and stifle you know energy production. You're going to get quite a, a toxic a toxic combination at the end of it. But the underlying reality of what we're seeing in the space is massive growth, massive innovation, and it's well money as as you put it. And um, so we're we're very bullish. And I don't know when it will decouple. You know the correlations as they tend to in times of great duress, correlations ten to one. We've been at all-time high correlations, and I do think we'll see a reversion to mean, and the correlations should be much, much lower than they are, and, and crypto should decouple. Um, but in line with that, I mean, what do you think the, the I mean, Web3, I, I get as a replacement for, for Silicon Valley, but the metaverse is something that's quite, it's still quite, um, what's the right word? Not opaque, but it's, it's amorphous. It's not really a solid thing that people can understand by definition of what it is, I suppose. But where do you see opportunities there? How do you see people bringing that to the, you know, how would you invest in that technically at this point in time? 
Yeah. Well, maybe before I answer that, I want to touch on the push and pull concept that you just articulated because I think that's I think that's perfect. You're exactly. There are two forces at play here. So one is, you know, of course, this this idea that you're going up against the incumbent. So how is this DeFi protocol going to compete with Goldman Sachs? It's exactly the backwards framing of the question, right? You need to frame it in the inverse, right? How is Goldman Sachs going to compete with a competitor? Uh, that has zero overhead and zero operating costs and no brick and mortar facilities and they have no employees to pay right and they provide exactly the same service, you know, if not a, a, a one that's better in the sense that it's orders of magnitude faster and cheaper and anyone anywhere in the world with an internet connection can can access it. Um, so I think increasingly again the framing is going to is going to be reversed, you know, how are these incumbents with even with their large balance sheets going to be able to compete with a competitor that offers the same product. Uh, at a you know a fraction of a fraction of a fraction one one thousandth uh, or one hundred thousandth of the cost, um, so so that's kind of the you know the the one side of it, and then the other you know the kind of push factor is an interesting uh, way to look at this as well. There's there's a protocol DVPN and it's a decentralized VPN network, right? Um, and and the beautiful thing with this is that it, it has hit an all time high every single month since the Russia Ukraine war broke out. You know, and this is this is both sides of the war. A decentralized VPN is, you know, or a VPN in general is about more than just you know um, privacy. It's also about accessing the free and open internet. So when you know Putin threatened to you know shut off uh, global internet access to 150 million Russians and return them back to kind of a a centralized intranet like uh, like North Korea has, um, it pushed you know not up the full 150 million, but it pushed a lot of a lot of Russians into uh, looking into things like. Uh, decentralized VPN networks so that they can continue accessing, you know, the democratic and free and open internet and 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 not get blasted with, you know, propaganda, Putin propaganda day in and day out. Um, and, uh, you know, the same thing on the other side of the war on the on Ukraine side. So this again goes back to this is real technology providing real value to real people. Um, and, and if we don't lose sight of that, then, you know, we're not so worried about what happens day over day and week over week. We, we know we're backing, you know, incredible tech we want to see exist in the future. Yeah, very, very, very true. I think that's that that's part of the um the, the, the thinking around it is that information is being restricted in a lot of different ways. And and that kind of leads me into the concern I have is around the risk, particularly from the regulatory side of things. Do you think that could be a big risk to to the further growth? I don't think CBDCs will be seen as competition. I mean, it's just it's still centralized. It's not uh it's not really in any way, shape, or form DeFi, but it just gives you another way to on ramp. But do you think there's going to be increased regulatory risk around the entrepreneurship in the space? Yeah, I'll take that. I mean, I think it's a great question, Mark. It's something that um, I think is going to become, you know, talked about more and more throughout this year. Also, just given the recent, uh, you know, things that we've experienced over the past six, seven, eight months. But in general, you know, first of all, M31 Capital, you know, we're, we're active, we're both an active voice in the regulatory sphere, both given my prior experience in traditional finance, but also partnerships that we have with, you know, a lot of, you know, crypto uh, and traditional regulators like GuideHouse, SIFMA, the Global DCA, other, other partnerships that we have where, you know, we sit down monthly and, and we meet and we discuss, you know, what are the potential policy changes on the horizon? What do they potentially mean for funds like M31 Capital? What do they potentially mean for the ecosystem? Um, and, and, you know, largely it, it, it's still very gray, right? But the, the thing, at least in the jurisdictions where we operate in, um, it's it's clear that the governments are, are both going to, you know, support and embrace crypto innovation, but with the proper, you know, consumer protections in place, which, you know, we fully embrace and support. We want this space to be a space that, you know, investors can come to and feel trusted that they're investing you know, money with a you know legitimate fund and a real product, and 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 so whatever protections they they need to put in place there, like we support that again. But the key is it's got to be right sized. It can't be you know some some legislation from you know forty years, fifty years ago, a hundred years ago mm -hmm. to try to you know fit a square into a circle. It's got to be right for what this asset class is, and um and, and we'll see where it goes, right? But you know the the best thing that we could possibly do is two things. One, go above and beyond what's required today, and that that would be my advice to anybody operating in this space. And then two, just keep that hyperactive pulse on what's coming up and and what it means, and 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 again, trying to make sure you're always well positioned for tomorrow. Those are the two two key takeaways. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, James. We really appreciate the um the uh the, the depth that you guys have gone to um 
I think from, from our point of view, there's going to be, uh, unfortunately, a period of, of consolidation in the space. Um, you know, some of the funds, I think there'll be a survivorship bias. Um, you know, we, we, we very much, um, you know, we back both you guys as a fund, but also the thematics that you're investing in, I think, are being very much, you know, underestimated in terms of the almost exponential applications and opportunities that are, that are there and the amount of fat that's in the margins of some of the incumbents that can be pulled back um, in, into kind of, you know, in, into, the, into the hands of entrepreneurs. I think sort of, um, you know, from, from my side, the kind of final question that I'd sort of like you to think about is, you know, often the space is evolving and often when we want to evolve, you know, have, having run funds which started off as, let's say, a global long short equity and eventually evolved into a multi-strat and so on, you have to sort of roll with the punches and evolve with the times. Um, but from your point of view, I mean, where, where do you guys perceive yourselves to be in the next few years? Where do you, what, what, what other funds would you look at launching? Where do you think the next big opportunities are going to come? We, we've spoken about, you know, Web3, we've spoken about, not really spoken about, but I know gaming, the metaverse, et cetera, is a big focus of yours along with DeFi. What's the next wave coming, do you think? Yeah, well, so I think, uh, you know, the, the high level on where we're going to be in five years and 10 years is, uh, is, uh, you know, kind of a boring answer in a way. We're going to be doing exactly the same thing, funding innovative, uh, disruptive technologies in the, in, the, in the crypto space. I mean, it, likely particularly in the DeFi and the Web3 sector, we're so early into these, uh, into both of these trends. Like, like you mentioned, DeFi didn't really exist prior to DeFi summer in 2020, and Web3 is really just now starting to take off on the application layer side. So the, you know, and, and look at how steeply asymmetric some of these trade-offs are. Like the DeFi sector's, you know, about 25 billion in, in combined market cap. And, and, you know, the financial services sector of the global economy is up north of $100 trillion, right? You fold in derivatives, you're talking in, in quadrillions. It's unfathomable how large, you know, traditional finance, how large the total addressable market of the DeFi sector is. In other words, you've got a $25 billion market cap chasing $100 trillion uh, mm. plus TAM at a minimum. So that's not a shift that happens overnight. That that takes time and that takes education. And and that that's what M31 is around to... Uh, to help catalyze and promote and the next the next sort of waves or thematics you see do you see anything i mean uh, as you said it didn't exist a few years ago in terms of what you see in the vc side all that capital that's flowing to vc what are the sort of applications people are talking about what are the i mean is it healthcare? Yeah. is it insurance is it you know there's some other industries that have yet to be disintermediated yeah well there's i mean there's two things now just, just focused in the in the crypto space and one is sort of this what I alluded to at the, at the very beginning of the call is proof of work or this proof of physical work uh, concept that's being built out. And what, what we love about this, and we're seeing more applications of this, is it's a bridge between um, you know, the online and the offline world. So things like Helium, it, leveraging a token incentive in the online world, the on-chain world, to get people out and about in the real world, distributing you know, hotspots and building out an, a physically decentralized global network for you know, cellular and 5G applications and IoT devices and, and all of this. So we're seeing more and more of those, those applications. Hive Mapper is another one for, you know, global decentralized censorship position uh, mapping and everything. So get, leveraging token incentives to get people out in the real world uh, and bridging that gap so that not everything in the crypto space is so circular or, or uh, you know, circularly referential. Um, is a is a big trend. We're seeing more of those applications, like Huddle. I mentioned earlier is a, a a good example, right? It's a it is it is a decentralized you know token back play, uh, but there's no reason why Web two companies uh, can't be running their meetings on um, on Huddle, uh, or why Web two companies that leveraging you know, that are leveraging uh, video applications uh, on their website or any or within their apps can't be doing that on Live Peer. And in fact, Live Peer onboarded you know over a hundred protocols and companies web two and web three companies and protocols in in just q1 of this year that's a hundred you know web two and web three protocols leveraging live peer on the back end uh, to build so we're seeing more examples of these real world use cases and a sort of bridge between the online and offline uh world with crypto and so yeah i mean that's a big trend that we get you know we're very encouraged by we're seeing a lot of uh green shoots in that space uh and the second is the the ownership economy so this is sort of tied to the the Web three um, space, but the idea that you know, sort of, Bitcoin was the first example of you know actual ownership over um, digital money. So it, it solved the double spend problem and it gave people strong property rights over digital money. Uh, what Web three is doing is sort of extending that 
that application to other types of digital assets, right? So you, you have, you know, um, domain names and intellectual property and, you know, um, you know, royalties and uh, all kinds of digitally native assets that if made scarce, you can, you can coordinate strong private property rights around and do very interesting things with. So I think it's an entirely, you know, what, what we're sort of calling web three, we're defining it by, you know, web one and web two and web three, we're defining them by their economic models that they use, right? So web one is, is kind of clearly defined by the fact that it had no economic model because it couldn't solve for digital scarcity. And so there was no native payments infrastructure uh, embedded into the early internet. Whereas web two was kind of the, the attention economy, the ad-based revenue model that kind of led to all these toxic downstream impacts like addictive algorithms and clickbait headlines and fake news and all of this. Um, and web three is solving a lot of that with, um, you know, the ownership economy. Uh, and so this this just gives rise to like we don't know what yet because this is going to you know, create a whole new kind of Cambrian explosion in uh, economic applications uh, online through digital stay properties. Tuned. Stay tuned for our next monthly newsletter, Mark, and <laughs> we'll, we'll okay. highlight the, the emerging threat, uh, theme, and trend that we see. But it's uh, yeah, it's crazy. I, I think one thing that um, <laughs> the audience could really take away from this conversation about the creation of decentralized autonomous solutions um, that will threaten the giant centralized solutions that are out there now, is that what they're reading in the newspapers now are more often than not ill-informed rot. Um, and a classic example of this is um, on our Australian Financial Review, well-respected newspaper here, a fellow called Christopher Joy, um, writes articles for it and regularly talks about the total and utter Ponzi scheme that exists in the world of cryptocurrency and that the entire thing is a Ponzi scheme. Now, the important thing to note about this is that his expertise is in fixed income security. And he's running a narrative on Web 3.0 and the metaverse. The knowledge gap is so giant, you'd have to get into a 300 kilometer hour car for two hours to get from one side to the other of that knowledge gap. Um, and, and so when you sit and listen to these newspapers, you just have to ask, who is the commentator? What is their knowledge base? And are they, do they have some grip on where a rapidly growing space like this is occurring? Back to our education, Michael and Nathan. You know, we've got to constantly talk about the fact that, you know, this is what Web 3.0 will look like. This is what Metaverse will look like. And this is how DeFi will operate in Web 3.0 and Metaverse. Um, you know, and I think that just opens up <clears throat> probably a thousand questions that we'd all like to continue asking on this space. I guess with the knowledge of the space is not growing linearly. It's not in a line. Um, major things can hit us from the left or field, left or right field that will, that will become the huge next Facebooks and and WhatsApps, et cetera, of this Web 3.0 environment. Um, Mark, I know we're running towards the end. Over to you. Yeah, no, there's no, there's nothing more from from my side really. It's been really great chatting to you guys. I think your your newsletter should be sort of required reading. Um, you guys really put in a lot of effort, and it's well read. I mean, I get north of fifty newsletters a month. Um, I try, you know, sample a few, but there's a few that I, I follow quite closely, particularly because, you know, your newsletter talks a lot about the unfolding themes, but also does a lot of deep dive thinking into those themes without just being, as you say, clickbait. Um, I think we're going to probably stop recording now and call it. Um, if there's any questions, if anyone wants to ask any informal questions, um, you know, please feel free. Um, I'm sure you guys will stick around for a few minutes afterwards. But otherwise, no, I'd just like to thank you very, very much for your time. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite late out there in in the US and Puerto Rico. So thanks again, it was really entertaining. And um, if anything, it's given me a lot more um, uh, confidence and reassurance in the space and the fact of where we are and that yes, we're in a difficult place in the world right now, but you know, no, you know, as, as in nature, no storm lasts forever, you know, and it will ease up at some point and we will see uh, you know, a bit of rationality and return to markets. And when people realize that this is probably the only real growth game left left in town and, and and showing exponential growth of that, I think we're going to see, a, we'll be pleasantly surprised where we see valuations a year from now. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks again, Mark, exactly. for having us on. And and like I said, like you, you know this already, but anytime, any question, reach out. Me and Nathan are happy to jump on a call with you, Derek, or any, any of your investors, you know, on the call. We're happy to, you know, spread that wealth of knowledge and education, whether it's joining webinars or what have you. So anytime. 
and that those that are online now and also those that will listen to the recording afterwards, how can they contact you if they wish to? So they go to our website. Oh, go ahead, Nathan. Yeah, our, our website, m31.capital, uh, on, on Twitter, at m31capital. And uh, each of us, I think uh, Mike and myself, it's just our full names on, uh, on Twitter as well. You can reach out directly through the website. Uh, it's probably the easiest way. Very Thanks so much for having Thank you very much, gent. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. We hope you've enjoyed our monthly webinar. All of Portal's webinars are available on our website, portal.am, or on the major podcast platforms. If you have any questions, comments, or suggested topics, please email us on info at portal.am. Feel free to subscribe and share with like-minded friends. Until next month, stay well, inquisitive, and engaged. Bye for now.